Hello, my name is Lyle Murphy, the founder of the Alternative to Med Center. Today, we're going to be talking about understanding anxiety and medication withdrawal symptoms. The first question we have is, are there different types of anxiety? And yes, as far as diagnostically, there is generalized anxiety disorder known as GAD. There is obsessive compulsive disorder known as OCD. There's panic disorder. There's post-traumatic stress disorder known as PTSD. And there's also social phobia, also known as social anxiety. The lens that we tend to look at anxiety through, which helps us with guiding the treatment, is are the symptoms of anxiety constant or are they intermittent? Intermittent type of anxieties are a lot easier to treat. They run the gamut of interdosing medication withdrawal, blood sugar problems, psychological needs, and a whole variety of things. However, when somebody feels like their nervous system is standing in the middle of the freeway, it's like a background war in their nervous system. More often than not, what those people are looking at is some underlying neurotoxicity that is whacking up how their neurochemicals tend to regulate themselves or even how to make the neurochemicals in the first place. And those situations are a bit more stubborn, but it is what we focus here on at Alternative to Med Center is unpoisoning people to the point where they can get a more normal regulation. Next question, do anti-anxiety drugs cure anxiety? And the answer I would have for that is no more than cocaine cures addiction. You are drugging a set of symptoms and you're having an effect. It's not actually curing it. It is in some degree masking it. And unfortunately, just like with the cocaine, these anti-anxiety medications by and large are not sustainable long-term in a way that you don't downregulate. In other words, become more used to the drug and need more of the drug, or maybe the drug stops working at all. However, you're still stuck in this place if you stop taking the drug, you go into abject withdrawal. And the withdrawal from benzodiazepines can be a lot more intense than withdrawing from cocaine or even heroin. Are there drug-free anxiety treatments? There are quite a panoply of them, and each one of these things would be dependent upon your own unique situation, which one would be the most efficacious. We have talk therapies such as Cognitive behavioral therapy, reducing exposure to electromagnetic frequencies that include your Wi Fi. Now, one of the proposed reasons for this is you know, it's a bit of a rabbit hole in itself, but um, mold toxicity called mycotoxins can cause a lot of anxiety in people. And molds produce 600 times the amount of mycotoxins in an electromagnetic environment, such as within an ambient room like this one, where you have computers, which you can't see, and video equipment and things that have EMF um, radiation, as opposed to if you took a mold colony, put a Faraday cage around it, it would produce 600 times less the mycotoxins that would be normally found in an urban environment. Eliminating MSG, MSG, well, the glutamate part is the most stimulatory neurochemical of the central nervous system, and you certainly don't want that if you're experiencing anxiety. There's other foods that contain glutamate, and you may want to research out glutamate-containing foods. Um, there's other diet modifications. Um, obviously, you know, you want to have things that are not having your blood sugar swing all over the place because blood sugar swings can certainly amplify anxiety. Generally, that shows up as more intermittent than constant. We test people for heavy metal and other neurotoxic accumulations in the body. Mercury is a known poison to the serotonin pathway and people that have a mercury burden that are susceptible to anxiety. Basically, if you're not making enough serotonin, you're going to be not sleeping, anxious, and having ruminating thoughts. Changing your environment to something that's more relaxing, where there's not a lot of chaos happening, soothing music, even maybe soothing non-flickering lights can also be one of the things that can just bring it down out of the rafters a little bit. Acupuncture, passion flower, also known as passiflora. Kava, although too much kava can actually be hard on the liver. GABA. Particularly forms of GABA that are more bioavailable, such as the sublingual tinctures and things, GABA as a supplement is not really that well absorbed and does not cross the blood-brain barrier to go where it needs to go that well. Taurine, though, helps recycle 
GABA. So taking taurine can help preserve the GABA that you have and make the GABA that you're taking work a little bit better. Glycine. Glycine is an inhibitory amino acid that can help especially with the central nervous system. Niacinamide. Niacin is actually in studies shown to be as effective as benzodiazepines. Now, we haven't necessarily duplicated that phenomenon here, but we do give niacin as it does help a good percentage of the people who are suffering from anxiety. Lysine and arginine. Magnesium. Magnesium actually is in a Myers cocktail. Magnesium is like one of those things that lessens the potential of you having depolarization at the synapse. In other words, it helps block calcium or at least regulate calcium so that the overall effect is that you're more sedated and less keyed up. Cannabidiol, also known as CBD. CBD is what they call an NMDA inhibitor. And uh, what that is, is a fancy term for saying that it blocks glutamate at the receptor. So this stimulatory neurochemical is not hitting as hard on the receptor and you get a bit of relief from that sort of impact. Another thing might be melatonin. Although people who are really keyed up, this may be more like ping pong balls bouncing off the Berlin wall, but it does help for a good number of people. Tryptophan and 5-HTP are precursors for the serotonin pathway and upping your serotonin levels can help distance you from underlying anxiety. Eliminating aspartame. Aspartame is a excitotoxin that is a, an artificial sweetener. And this excitotoxin, basically what an excitotoxin does is it stimulates a nerve cell to death. That's what excitotoxic means. And this is what you're consuming if you're drinking diet sodas and other things that contain aspartame. Eating organic food, especially organic fruits and vegetables. A lot of these pesticides, the way that they kill a pest is by overstimulating its nervous system to the point of it going into tetany and dying. We have the same or similar neurochemicals in our nervous system as are found in the nervous system of, let's say, a grasshopper. And these organophosphates and organocarbamates also affect us in similar ways. And of course, the phytonutrients that are found in organic fruits and vegetables are also going to help on their own level detoxify us and provide antioxidants to neutralize any body burden that we may already have. Valerian extract. Clinical trials have showed repeatedly that it's safe and in most clinical trials effective for anxiety. Next question. Can anti-anxiety medications cause dependence and withdrawal when stopped? You betcha. These benzos are probably the slipperiest slope, in some ways more addictive and harder to get off of than even opiates or fentanyl. Now, benzos are not likely to kill you from an overdose, in the same way as opiates, but they have a special sort of claw that can hold on very tightly. In fact, um, back when Stevie Nicks attended her own drug rehab, one of the things that she was famous for saying is her hatred for the opiate users because they were over it in a matter of week or weeks, and she was still suffering months later after coming off of Valium. And it can very much be like that. You're taking something that causes downregulation that you will have downregulation as a result of, which means the drug will become less and less and less and less and less effective. Yet, if you take away the drug, then you could find yourself hurting a lot. But yet, on the DEA list, they're listed as low chance of addiction, which is honestly quite retarded to even make that statement. Next question, what are common anti-anxiety drug withdrawal symptoms and can they be eased? The withdrawal symptoms are going to look a lot like anxiety, uh, difficulty in sleeping. If you go too fast and you were taking a lot of anti-anxiety medications, you might even be looking at seizures. So coming off medications such as benzos has to be done with a careful precision. For most people, a benzo withdrawal is not a couple day event, which is what you typically would find in acute detox facilities. Ripping somebody off of benzos, not only does it not work well for the two or three days, maybe five days if they're in an acute detox, but people can't sustain it, they hurt too much, and they have to reinstate. And 
Honestly, the three to five days is what the insurance pays for for most policies. So the detox facility will kick you out, even though you're still fragile because you're not paying for it anymore. The insurance companies really need to reframe their viewpoint on acute benzo withdrawal to have the insurance cover more treatment than just a rapid detox. But some of the things that can help ease this is if you're taking multiple medications, let's say you're taking a stimulant such as Effexor and you're also on clonopin. It would be much easier to take and withdraw from the effects or first, because if you try to withdraw from the clonopin first and you're still on that stimulating medication, it could complicate and exacerbate your withdrawal and anxiety. If you're only taking a medication such as, let's say, Ativan once a day at night, and you find yourself going into withdrawal, probably two or three o'clock in the afternoon, that is likely because you're going through introducing withdrawal. So let's say, for instance, you're taking a milligram and a half at night. Maybe you want to take a milligram at night and another half a milligram in the daytime, or maybe even a milligram at night and a quarter milligram in the morning and a quarter milligram in the afternoon to help kind of pave over that introducing withdrawal phenomenon. And then as you reduce the medications, you just reduce a little bit of a time, trying to keep somewhat of a spread throughout the day so that you are bridging over the half-life of the drug and not going into withdrawal from each medication dose within the same day. There's a lot of the non-drug therapies that we talked about before, that list, those can help ease the withdrawal. And for people who need something relatively simple and straightforward in order to assist them in their withdrawal, for many people, gabapentin can be a temporary bridge as they transition from the full benzodiazepine onto something that is, realistically, it's chemical nature is that of a prescription supplement. It's GABA, a naturally occurring substance attached to a pentane molecule. And it's really the only drug I'm aware of that delivers a naturally occurring neurochemical to your brain and, and can increase intracranial GABA levels. Your body is not perceiving it as a poison. You don't use liver enzymes to break this medication down. It's actually water soluble and is processed right out of your kidneys. And your, your body's not perceiving it as a poison. Can people get attached to it? Most certainly. Can people have a difficult time coming off of gabapentin? Yes, those are usually the more neurotoxic people that have other things going on that make it difficult for them to be off medications in the first place. But for most people, if they're struggling with a benzo withdrawal, that can be a way to help get over some of the humps. Next question, how does tolerance to anti-anxiety medications happen? Just like with a lot of other drugs like cocaine or heroin, what you have is you have a drug that's increasing the amount of GABA that can get out of the originating neuron. So it increases the permeability of that membrane. By doing so, it's kind of like increasing your foot on the gas pedal of your vehicle. It's pushing more gas, obviously, into the engine, but it's not putting any gas back. So you're quickly spending all of the GABA that you have to have a potentized effect. And as you keep taking that medication, you've exhausted all of the GABA. So the medication in and of itself stops working nearly as effectively. Strangely enough, the same people who have been exhausted from GABA, from taking a benzo, tend to feel very sedated, strangely enough, because these are the people that don't get sedated even from four milligrams of Ativan tend to get sedated to a point that they feel uncomfortable even on modest amounts of gabapentin because gabapentin is actually putting that GABA back. And if they're still taking the benzo at the same time, now they're getting much more of an effect out of their benzo. And um, again, another way to possibly transition if you're really stuck in a benzo. Next question, can a person who suffers from anxiety become addicted to anti-anxiety medication? Well, a person who has anxiety is going to be more prone to get addicted to an anti-anxiety medication than someone who doesn't have anxiety that just happens to take it one night because it's not going to fit that lock and key mechanism. They're going to be like, oh, God, I don't feel good from that, and they don't ever want to take it again. It's usually the person's like, oh, that helped me with my anxiety. That's more prone to take it the next day and the next day and the next day and find themselves in the, uh, the rat trap of being stuck on that med. So I guess what the person was asking with this question is, if I'm taking it as prescribed, can I get addicted to it? Yes, absolutely. Next question, can you overdose on anti-anxiety medications? 
Um, yes, and people do it quite a bit. Benzos are a popular drug to try to OD with. And strangely enough, it doesn't usually result in a fatality. It may cause an acute respiratory distress. It may knock you into a coma. But strangely enough, people tend to survive and come out of it maybe with some brain impairment, but don't actually die from it. You can, but it's not common like um, opiates. You can OD on opiates and you don't come back. Next question, can counseling help with anxiety symptoms? So again, this goes back to um, your type of anxiety. If you are having the constant, unrelenting nervous system standing in the middle of the freeway, yes, you can meditate yourself to the top of the mountain. You can work with a counselor and maybe during that time you feel a bit of relief. But unfortunately, it's not touching the neurophysiological reasons as to why you're having anxiety. Now, if you have an intermittent type of anxiety, especially one that is more of a social nature, then yes, certainly counseling can help you with that and breathing techniques and meditation and other things. Um, sometimes for some people, it's their blood sugar that's causing their intermittent anxiety or again, like they were taking their medications. Those things obviously would have to be fixed on their own terrain. But for the intermittent type of anxiety, the counseling can help. If you're that constant neurotoxic profile, honestly, the only thing that's really going to touch that is getting those neurotoxins out of there because the counseling, the talk therapy is just going to go in a loop and you're still going to be anxious even about what you talked about in therapy. Next question, can education help ease anxiety symptoms? The breathing techniques, the cognitive behavioral therapy, these are all things that can help, again, especially with the social anxieties, the intermittent type of OCD, and for anxiety that has a come and go nature. It's not going to help that much with um, the persistent unrelenting anxiety, especially with the panic disorder. When somebody has a panic attack, oftentimes what's happening is they're not breathing deep enough. If you aren't breathing deep enough, you get carbon monoxide built up in your blood. That carbon monoxide then causes a pH change that causes part of your brain called the locus ceruleans to get like in collusion with your amygdala to dump a bunch of norepinephrine, which is the chemical equivalent of anxiety if you have too much. That hit of anxiety causes you to what? If you've ever seen somebody in a panic attack, they take off and they go running. When they go running, they get maybe half a block down the street and they're <laughs> breathing a lot better and they feel better. So um, sometimes you can thwart that panic attack phenomenon by just taking those deep breaths before it turns into a crisis moment for you. Next question. Can proper breathing help with anxiety? Well, I guess we kind of answered that in the last question. Um, uh, and what happens if you have short and shallow breathing, um, breathing deeper can actually offset the amount of carbon monoxide that may be building up and cause you anxiety. Next question, where can I get more information on tapering from anti-anxiety drugs? So we have a link on the website I would draw your attention to. Some of the information in there is helpful even if it's not a benzodiazepine that you're on. But is the alternative to Med Center blog called Benzodiazepine Tapering? If you were to go to the website, there's a search bar on the website, put in Benzodiazepine Tapering, and you will get a choice of pages. One of them certainly would be called Benzodiazepine Tapering, and go to that page, and there's a lot of information there for you to read. Other than that, I really appreciate you watching this video. And do know that anything that you've heard from me is not to be taken as medical advice. Anything that you want to share with your prescriber, please do. But do not change your medications or take nutritional supplements until you've consulted with a professional prescriber to help guide you on what may or may not be good for you. Or another thing you can do is you can call our hotline. Our 800 number is somewhere on the page and we can give you some more guidance. If you can't come to the center and be an actual patient, maybe we can help find someone in an area with you that can help you through these situations. Thank you and have a good day or night. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. For information about Alternative to Med Center, give us a call at 888-984-9667.